This is the Lo-Fi Ultralight Titanium Wood Gas Stove. I've been testing this through the fall, all through the winter, and now into the spring. I think I have enough experience to give you my thoughts on it. If you're interested, keep watching. All right, before we get started, a couple things. First, I want to thank Johnny for sending me the Lo-Fi stove so that I could share it with you. So this is probably the stove I've tested most out of anything in my collection. And, and as you're well aware, I've tested a lot of stoves. I tested it through the fall, through the winter, and now into the spring. I take, about, take it out just about every time I go out into the woods, and with good reason. It performs, it really does, and we'll get into that in a minute. And it had better perform because this thing is not cheap. It sells for 185 UK pounds or 317 Canadian dollars, so it is not a cheap stove. But is it worth the money? And that's what part of what we're going to be looking at today. I'll tell you right now, it performs, but is it worth the money? Well, what we're going to do is we'll look at the stove a little closer. I'm going to give you all the specifications for it, everything that it came with, how it operates. We'll do two demonstrations with it with different types of fuel. I'll talk about the alternative fuels that I tested with it. But I'm also going to do a cost-benefit analysis comparing against what I see as its two major competitors. First is the BioLite stove, because it is also an electronically operated wood gas stove, as well as something that I don't know if people would look to think to compare this, and that is a gas canister stove, and it compares very well there. All right, let's get started. All right, let's take a look what all came with the stove. So I'll start with the obvious. This is the manual and warranty information. It has all the specifications and operation and everything else you want inside. It's all graphically done. So everything you need to know for the operation of the stove is here. Good to look at. It's not something you're going to take out very often. You won't need to. It's just that simple an operation. Here's everything else that Johnny sent me with one more thing that I'll show you in a minute. So this is everything you need to function as a cook kit. So inside of this first case, this first stuff sack, is a 750 milliliter pot, titanium of course, bale handles, lo-fi insignia on the side, and a small formed, uh, what you call it, pour spout. And of course it does come with measurements on the side. The stove itself is actually inside of here, so let's get at that. Inside there is another stuff sack, fits in perfectly. Inside of this stuff sack is the stove, so let me take this out. So the stove has a couple of components to it. First off is the body of it, of course. It has the ember guard. We'll talk more about that in a minute because this is actually quite a keen little piece of uh, equipment or quite an important piece of equipment. And this, which is your electrical cord that'll go from your power bank to the stove. And it has a, gen a, a, a little turn knob on it that allows a different amounts of energy to get different amount of flame come out of it. So that's everything that's included. First off, let's, let me just grab the specifications. We'll go through those quickly. All right, I have my notes with me so I can give you this information. Of course, I will put all this in the video description if you want to reference it later. So let's just break it down to start with. You can buy some of these things as options. For instance, you don't have to buy the titanium pot if you just want to buy the stove itself. You can do that, but I'll tell you, they're a great combination together. So let's just do the stove itself. To start with, the stove is five ounces. 143 grams. If you add the stuff sack in, then it's 5.7 ounces, and that's just a little bit heavier. Now, the total weight, if you put everything that I've shown you back together in their stuff sacks, will come in at 10.3 ounces, 304 grams. That's with this 750 milliliter pot and everything else. Now, the stove itself, height 4.3 inches, 110 millimeters, diameter 3.4 inches, 87 millimeters. Now, I did say it was electrically operated. I'm going to talk about options that you have there in a moment, but let's just talk about the power draw because I think that's probably what most people, myself included, were wondering. How much power does it actually draw? Well, it has that cable that I showed you that plugs into your power bank and other sources. I'll talk again about it in a minute. USB type C on the other end and the turn thing here, turn button thing. There is a name for it, of course, that adjusts the amount of energy being delivered to the stove. If I run the stove on lowest current, it'll draw 45 milliamps. If I run it on its highest, and you'll see both of these in action in a minute, it'll draw 310 milliamps. Now, I have a 10,000 milliamp hour battery power bank that I'll be uh, showing you, and that's what I've been using it with right through the whole winter. If I use that, I can get 24 hours constant runtime on high, 
and 175 hours on low. So you don't have to worry about running the bank out. You can be out for days and days and you know, you'll never run your battery down that badly. Now I talked about alternative power sources. You can also I have a number of flashlights in my collection that I can use this type of a cable on to power my stove. So if you have one of those flashlights and you, if you want to use the fast cable charge, the you know, USB type C to you and USB type C on the other end, you can run that off of most phone. In fact, if you have a cable like that, you can run it off most of the newer smartphones. They have what's known as reverse charging. I actually tried it with my cell phone. I was a little nervous when I first started because I didn't want to damage my new cell phone but my cell phone can power the stove. Now, honestly, that's not something I'm going to do because I want my cell phone charged just in case I do need it. But it's good to know that if you really had to get that fire going and for some reason you forgot your power bank, then you can use this with your cell phone as you're likely to have that. Okay, so those are the specifications for this. Now, I just want to show you one more thing before we move on. And let me just put the stove and pot down. So Johnny also sent this on. It also has his lo-fi symbol on the side and uh, it's a little carbon steel pruning shears, I guess, pruning clippers if you want. And I looked at it when I first got it and I said, you know, it's made of plastic, good plastic, rubberized. You know, what do I need this for? Well, um, you know, I was out breaking sticks and things with my fingers. And then one day I decided to take this out, buy it. <laughs> I'm telling you now, unless you can get ones just like it somewhere else, buy it from Johnny because this makes the job of cutting up small sticks for the right size for the stove so much easier and faster. And it's not a very expensive item to have. It locks in the closed position. It's worth having and using with this stove. If you don't buy it from Johnny, get another pair because it makes all the difference. I was using my knife and hitting it and sticks were going flying. This is full control. You, know, you can actually drop the sticks right into the stove while it's operating with a little bit of practice. All right, let's move on. All right, I want to talk for this, about the stove for just a few minutes, talk about some of its key features before I get to the demonstrations. In fact, what I'm going to do is leave that cost-benefit analysis comparing it against gas canister stoves and the BioLite stove until after we do the demonstrations, because I think that's what everyone wants to see is this in operation, and, and that's what I'm going to use to cook my lunch, so I want to get to it as quickly as possible. So just a couple things to be known about this. It is a wood gas stove, so let me just show you the inside of it. And you can see around the upper rim near the vents, all the secondary jets in there. There is a fan built into the bottom of this stove. And by the way, that fan is replaceable. If for whatever reason it stops working for you, it is accessible. You can see the screws on the bottom there. And Johnny sells the fans uh, as an alt, as a, you know, if you have to replace it for whatever reason. And uh, there are a series of jets around the inside at the bottom as well. So that's where your primary and your secondary air feed goes on the top. Now you can see that the exhaust ventilation is very uh, light at the top. There's not a lot of it and it doesn't need it because it's such a clean burning stove. Now I mentioned the Ember Guard and I found this to be a really, really cool thing because, well, number one, Ember Guard suggests that it's there to prevent sparks from coming out and flying through the air. That's its primary purpose and it does that very well. But what I also discovered with this, it acts like a condenser. It helps to keep wood gases in the stove while they are uh, burning so that they can be burnt off in the in the secondary combustion that takes place. So it does a good job of that. Last thing I found, and this was, uh, Johnny didn't mention this, I just found it by accident. You can see how it's kind of slightly bowl shaped towards the center. And when you're feeding the stove after it gets lit and you've got a load of wood going in there and it's starting to burn down, then that's where you can just drop sticks in. It almost guides the sticks into the center of the stove. So it focuses the flame, prevents em or sparks from flying out, and helps to condense all the wood gases for complete combustion. So it's actually qu quite an ingenious little piece to put on this. Now, the only thing I'm gonna say is, and you'll see me when I start the demonstration with it, is make sure you get it on early enough because if you're trying to get it on when there's a lot of flame coming out of this, you're gonna find that challenging. So you want this on early enough. So, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a moment. Okay, so there, that's what I wanted to say about it. It is electronic in nature. Now, I'm gonna say this again because this bears repeating more than one time. 
do not operate this stove with a fire in it without having the fan running at the same time. And uh, it, it's easy enough to forget, but you don't have to worry about wasting pa uh, power out of your battery when you're operating this stove. In other words, get the stove lit, turn the fan on and let the thing go cold before you actually turn the fan off because you don't want any heat at the bottom of the stove where the fan is. See the fan is just underneath the bottom of the stove so you don't want any heat that might damage the fan itself and that's a very important thing. Now like I said it, mistakes can happen so if it does happen to you then Johnny will sell you a replacement fan cool thing about that is, and that's a pun of course, is that I could pick the stove up while it's operating because right down there at the base where the fan is remains cool throughout the operation. Now what's great about that is not so much the picking up and moving it because uh, that's a bit chancy, um, is the fact that you're not going to damage anything underneath. You don't have to worry about putting this on a surface and having heat transferred down into anything combustible or on a picnic table where it might mire the surface of it. It actually stays very very cool. All right. That's all the key features for it and uh, well I guess now let's just get it in operation. I'll talk a little bit more as I set it up and get my lunch on. All right like I mentioned I'm going to do two demonstrations with this stove. First I'm going to cook my lunch and I'm going to be using wood for the first demonstration because that's, well, that's obviously what it is a wood stove and the second demonstration will be with wood pellets and that's when I go to make my coffee after I finish my lunch. So let's get this going. So you can see I did clear a little bit of it's wet anyway a little bit of uh, sur surface area off. If you're really concerned you could put something underneath it but honestly from my experience there's nothing to be concerned about here. So here is my power bank. This is the one I've been carrying most often. This is my Claris K5. I did review this separately. The reason I choose to use this is because it has a um, IP68 waterproof rating on it. Can't beat that, right? So, and it has a digital display, so I know how much power it's actually using. Now, I've got a bunch of sticks. Literally, I don't think I walked 10 feet away from where I'm sitting right now. Pick these up off of the ground, so we'll get that going. So the first thing to do, if you're going to use a top-down burn, which is what I would recommend, is get your sticks, break them up. Some of them I can break by hand, obviously. I'll get a few of these going in here. And I'm going to show the clippers because this is this makes life so much easier. These are a ratcheting clipper or a pruner, I guess. So if it doesn't cut with the first grip, uh, it cuts with the second one. And it handles some pretty good sized pieces. So it doesn't take long to fill it up. Now, yes, I could be breaking this all up by hand, but when it gets to little tiny pieces, it can be a little bit of a challenge breaking them small. So this is going to make life a lot easier. And all right, that's not bad. A few that flew, flew out on me. Um, how much to put in when you start? I don't know. You can put in maybe a little bit more than half full. It's not that you, I mean, you can fill this all the way up to just below the secondary jets and have it function just the way it should. Let me just try a little bit heavier wood. This is heavy though, or thick, I should say. It's old. And yeah, as long as you stay below the secondary jets, you're going to get that, com that pyrolysis and secondary combustion take place so that's where I want to be with my fuel all right now that's definitely all that I need in there to do make my lunch so since it's a top-down burn I'm going to be lighting uh, some fire lighter on top of the wood here you can see what I've got loaded inside now and then I've got some just some little sticks here very the very fine ones probably a few more and they'll go in on top of my fire lighter and uh, that will get everything going but by that time I will have had the uh, fan going to make sure that I don't cause any damage and just to accelerate everything so plug my fan into my battery or not my fan the the cord itself and into the USB type C the moment I plug this in I'll, I'll wait just a moment to do so the fan starts on low so let's get them some fire starter going here I have some little mix of some fat wood and some waxed wood chips, things that I kind of mix together. Doesn't take a whole lot to do this. Actually, that's probably more than enough. Here's a little bit of fat wood just to kind of help things go along. And where is my lighter?
get that lit. You can see that lights up nice and quickly. Put my lighter away. Now, I'm good for a minute or two here before, you know, the, the really starts going. So it's nice to have that little top fire engaged before I turn the fan on because uh, then the flames just, well, you'll see in a second when I do so, they start roaring out. So I'm just still creating that top burn. And because of the fat wood, you can see the smoke. Oh, that's enough. Now, here's what I'm talking about. Better if I had gloves, but best to get it on now before I put it out, of, put the fire out. All right. Make sure you get it on straight when you go to put it on, though. There, that dropped in nicely. So it is actually burning down inside there, but watch what happens when I plug the fan in now. And that's the fan on low, but immediately the flames are starting to come up through. Uh, I'm just gonna let this go for a second before I put my lunch on, because I just wanna talk about this. Actually, no, I won't. I will get it going, put my lunch on, and then we'll talk a little bit more about this operation of the stove. So first thing I'm gonna do, my lunch, by the way, is a couple of hard boiled eggs because they're just so simple to cook up, so nutritious, especially for somebody on a low carb diet like I am, and they don't take long to cook. So I have my eggs in the water. Now I'm gonna turn the fan up high just so you can see what happens when I do so, and then I'll put the pot on. I mean, that's like a forge. Look at that flame. Still a little bit of smoke, but that's the fat wood that I put on. I mean, that's, this has some amazing performance going for it. Now, it's going to get noisy, so I am going to move back a little bit away from that while it's starting to bring the oil, eggs to a boil, while I talk about uh, some of my experiences using this. All right, you can probably hear the fan roaring next to me uh, as that uh, quickly brings my water to a boil for the hard boiled egg. So a couple of things I want to mention. I just wanted to move away from that noise so you could hear me a bit more clearly. One of the complaints that I heard from a few people who saw the stove being operated in some of my earlier videos is that it's got such a small burn chamber that you're going to be feeding a lot of wood into it. And that is true. Uh, depends on how long you need the stove to run. I don't know that I'll need to put any wood in this burn, this, the burn chamber for the purpose of bringing those eggs to a boil. Certainly not for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. That was more than enough wood to do so. But it's very, very simple to add fuel. In fact, I'll show you in a minute adding fuel to it. I, I will cut a few more of those sticks using those uh, loppers, the, the pruners, and I just lift the pot, throw them in, and uh, we're good to go. It doesn't take very much effort at all. I mean, that's true of all small stoves. It doesn't matter what kind of stove you're using, uh, small stove that is, uh, they're all going to require that. Now, here's an experience thing that I had over the winter I think is worth knowing. My experience during cold weather is, is that small stoves don't do well. They just can't reach that critical mass of heat needed to be self-sustaining. Well, okay, they can, but it's much more challenging. Let's put it that way. Your wood has to be especially dry. It has to be not windy. You had to have a good base of fire going. It's more challenging. And they still go through a lot of wood, and they hardly ever create the heat that you're looking for in the cold weather. I'm not talking about spring and fall. I'm talking about midwinter, of course. Not this one. If I could get dry wood in that, it burnt just the same as it's doing right now. In fact, my water, how quick was that? My water's almost to a boil. I may have to put another piece of wood or two in just to make sure it boils long enough to harden up the eggs. But yeah, it works well in cold weather. I can't say that about too many of the small stoves that I have. Now, here's the other thing, and Johnny does this very well on his channel. Johnny's in the UK, by the way, and he's been testing this stove for a few years. He did, this is a small cottage industry. Johnny makes these things himself. He experimented and went through a Kickstarter process, and uh, you need, there's a YouTube, Johnny has his own YouTube channel, so I'm gonna link that at the end of this video so you can go see some of the operations, some of the things that he's done. But in testing, he tested all kinds of things in his stove. Well, I thought I'd try and do some of the same. So I tried things like, uh, just watching my stove there, still running well. I tried things like, uh, he shows using ramen noodles. Um, I didn't have any ramen noodles, but I did try pasta and it worked. Now, there, for the things I'm about to mention, you have to have a fire going before you start adding these. It wasn't easy to get it going right off the stove. 
pasta, noodles, things like that will work well. I tried peanuts. Now, peanuts are very oily, as you can imagine. I'm serious, peanuts. If the fire was going, it burnt hot and fast. Now, it did leave a bit of a messy residue behind. I tried some crackers. I tried, you know, things that you wouldn't normally think of as fuel. You can use chips if that's what you want to use. Um, I recommend staying away from oily things because they, as I mentioned, they leave a bit of a residue behind. Any dry organic matter can be used in this. I tried pine cones, and there's lots of them around here. My problem with the pine cones is they're from the white pine tree, so they're quite big. One, I can only get one of those in the burner unless I break it all up. They burn really, because of the resins in them, they burn really hot, really fast, intense flame, but they don't last all that long. So pine cones are a viable alternative fuel. They just have more challenges than, there, my eggs are boiling already, so that's great. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to add some fuel, but one more thing that, and I'll show adding the fuel, one more thing that I did try, and this was kind of because Johnny did it, I had to try it. I don't have any sheep dung that I can get my hands on like he did, but I have deer pellets that I picked off off the forest floor here. They have to be dry, they can't be fresh, but if they're dry, they're just organic matter, and they will burn in this stove. Don't try it wet, trust me, the smell is not pleasant. All right, I'm going to add a few more pieces of wood to this so you can see me doing that, and it's only been a couple minutes of operation, so just give me a second to position the camera. All right, so the truth of the matter is, you can see the water is hot. Um, if I hadn't been talking, I would have been paying closer attention to everything that I was doing. But I just want to show you, is that, no, I'm going to need gloves for that. It does get a little hot, of course. Where's the other glove? The eggs are just coming to a boil, and I suspect there's plenty of heat. Oh yeah, look at that. See, there's all kinds of heat in there. I didn't need to have to worry about refueling. But if I did, I'd, what I would probably do, not probably do, what I would do is I'd have a small store of these little sticks just sitting here ready for me to drop in the stove at any time. But that initial load looks like it's going to be plenty to bring those eggs to a hard boil. Actually, the eggs are... They're boiling a low boil right now. Let's, we're going to talk about simmer in a minute just to tell you my experiences because not all your cooking is going to be a hard, fast boil like this is. Sometimes you want to slow it down and simmer as well. So I'll talk about that now. All right, well, my eggs are pretty much boiled long enough now. I will have to let them cool down for a few minutes before I can shell them and eat them. But just as they finish off here, I wanted to talk about simmering very quickly. So. This stove excels at bringing water to a boil very quickly. And if you're making a rehydrated meal or freeze-dried meal, anything like that, or noodles, this is really, really quick and very effective for doing that. But, and if you're making coffee or teas, same thing. But sometimes you want to have slow the burn down for a simmering purpose. Maybe you've got a pan that you want to try to cook some eggs in. Now that would be a challenge with this, but it can be done. It just means that you'll have to pay attention a little bit closer to what you're doing. So what I found is if I wait until my primary fuel is burnt down to a hot embers and then turn the fan down to its lowest, that I've greatly reduced the amount of heat that's coming out of the top of that. And you can get very close to a simmering or a low heat enough for cooking eggs or reheating food in the pot as you want. Uh, you do have to be cautious. You have to be constantly focused on it to make sure that things don't burn or stick because it's still a hot stove regardless. So I just wanted to put that out there that you can simmer with this, but it's like simmering with a gas canister stove or uh, you know trying to fry eggs with a gas canister stove. It can be done. It just means you have to pay attention to it a little bit more so. Okay, my eggs are done now. So what I'll do is take a break, wait for them to cool off, eat them, and then I'm going to come back, make my coffee. But in order to do that, I have to reuse the stove again. So I'm going to load it up with wood pellets. All right, the lunch is finished. Now it is coffee time. And as promised, I'm going to be using wood pellets to boil my water for the coffee. Now, just before we get going, a couple things because of course once the fan gets going on this it gets a little harder to uh, hear me. Um, I did a lot of testing with wood pellets because I figured that's one measurable fuel that I can use and quantify the results from and compare with things like uh, the gas canister stove. So a lot of my testing was done that way. So one of the things I wanted to know is just how much wood pellets this would hold. 
So just below the, the secondary jets at the top, I filled it up, then I weighed it, and I got 185 grams of wood pellets. And in burn, in burn time, I got 20 minutes of burn. Now, flame went out in about 18 minutes, but then I got continuous heat. Actually, it was longer than 20 minutes, but, because, but the heat started to diminish after 20 minutes. It would still simmer, but it wouldn't bring anything to a boil. So they ran a long time. That's plenty long for just about everything you would need to do if you filled it all the way to the top. But it's not often you're going to do that. So I also tried to figure out what is the minimum amount of pellets I could put in here to bring two cups of water to a boil? Because that's the average measurement we use is two cups of water. And I found I could get away with as little as 45 grams of pellets. Now I'm going to do uh, talk about the cost of these things in a few moments time, but it's relative to what you have to pay for wood pellets, of course. 45 grams. And in doing so, with that 45 grams, I could bring two cups of water to a hard rolling boil in eight minutes. So very respectable. I'm somewhere, you know, not quite as fast as, my, as a, a gas canister stove, but probably right around where uh, an alcohol stove, a good alcohol stove will do for two cups of water. So now that's everything I'm going to say about the pellet testing. I'll talk more about the cost benefit analysis in a moment. So let's get this going so I can get my lunch on. Oh, by the way, I'm going to do something a little different. I want, this is the lo-fi pot, still got some water in it from lunch. Now, I'm going to actually drink my coffee out of this pot. So what am I going to, build? And, and I'm making it with an AeroPress because that's one of my favorite ways of making it. I, have, I brought another pot with me and I'm going to talk more about this pot in a minute, but this is my Fire Maple 900 milliliter Alti Titanium Pot. And what's really cool about this is when everything's in their stuff sacks, the stove inside of the lo-fi lo pot it fits just perfectly inside of the 900. Why would you want to do that? Well, it's nice to have two pots, especially when one of the pots, the lo-fi pot that I'm using here, the 750, can become my coffee pot. And so that's what I'm going to do with it today. Today's, this is going to be a coffee cup, and I'm going to boil the water for making my coffee using the fire maple. So let's get some wood pellets in. I didn't bring a lot of wood pellets out. I'm not measuring, not weighing them. Uh, that's about, nah, you can say probably about a third of the way full. That's plenty actually to bring this to a boil. Now, you do have to light it somehow, your wood pellets. These are hard wood pellets. They take a few seconds to light up. I found one of the most effective ways for lighting wood pellets is hand sanitizer. So that's what I'd like to use. You could use alcohol of any type as well, but hand sanitizer works just fine. Now, I do have to get that lit, so what I have is a little bit of that other fat wood material, which I'm gonna light, and then drop that in on top of the wood pellets. If I can get a bit going. That's a bit better, that's more like fat wood, isn't it? And here's the problem. I'm sure it's lit, but it's so hard to see alcohol burning in the daylight. Just the same, I'm gonna assume that it is lit. Put my ember guard on, plug it in, the fan will be on low. Yeah, okay, I can see the alcohol with the shadow, I can see the alcohol. I'll just show you this, I can pick it up and I can even lean it towards you a little bit. And I'm just gonna let that run for a second to make sure it's well engaged. There's probably no reason to. In fact, there isn't much of a reason at all, is there? All right, so let's clean the bottom of my pot off. The pellets are not fully engaged yet, but they're burning and there's no reason to waste the heat. In a few minutes time, I'm gonna give you a top-down view inside just to show you the gas gasification and secondary combustion taking place. In the meantime, I'm going to get my coffee ready uh, to make. And so bring it back in a moment. All right, I thought I'd give you a quick shot of what looks like burning inside there. That's impressive, right? Look at that. Absolutely no smoke, intense heat. Hard to see with the ember guard on, but all of the jets are firing at the same time, producing a lot of heat. Won't take long for my water to come to boil now. 
All right. Used the AeroPress, made myself some coffee. Actually used the lo-fi pot to use as my mug. You can still see it's quite hot. I have a lip guard on it as well. Oh, it is good though. Still just a tiny bit hot. I don't want to uh, let it go cold. So we won't spend a lot of time talking about this. All right, I have my notes here because there's a few things I want to talk about before we wrap this video up. Uh, in the beginning, I talked about the value because this is not an inexpensive stove by any means. Of course, that's relative to whether or not how much you want it and does it fit your needs and your usage. And I think regardless of price, a lot of people are going to look at this stove and say, I got to have it because it performs so, so very well. Um, I'm going to put all the comparisons, all the cost benefit analysis that I made in the video description and not go through it line by line here for you, but I'll give you the summary of what it is. So there's a couple things I wanted to compare. One thing is I mentioned the uh, BioLite stove. So I have used BioLite stoves in the past. I know how they operate. I just don't own one right now. So I couldn't do a side-by-side -side comparison between the two. But as far as the design and function, those are the two closest that you have. The BioLite stove is a battery operated stove. It is a wood gas stove. Mind you, it has some benefits or some features going for it that the lo-fi doesn't. In other words, it charges its own battery through a pelotonin. I think it is a uh, arrangement. It's where you can turn heat into energy and that uses to charge the battery. They can use that battery to recharge your phone or run lamps. There's a number of things you can do with it. So BioLite has some interesting additional features for it, but my memory of using them is, is that they're very much the same. They, it, performance wise in terms of burning wood and wood pellets, it was no better than this stove. In fact, I don't know if it was as good. But the difference is the weight. Now let me just give you the weight. So a BioLite stove, and you have to have a pot, so you might as well have their pot, weighs in at two pounds six ounces, which is 935 grams. I mean, <laughs> compare that to this entire setup that I have here, which is, what did I say, 10.3 10 ounces. Actually, that's not entirely true because I didn't include the weight of the battery. Now, the truth is I take the battery with me anyway because I want it for recharging uh, this camera, for instance, or I want it recharging my phone or my flashlight, so I have the battery, but I will give you the weight with the battery in a minute because it is relative. You do have to have a power source to use the lo-fi but not only is it uh, what how many times heavier than the other one than the bio or than the stove good lord three times heavier three times heavier for the BioLite stove to get the same kind of performance. Uh, so that's one thing. Now, how about the price? Is it cheaper than the BioLite stove? Well, it's not cheaper, but it's not a big price difference. So as I mentioned, I did Canadian comparisons for this stove at 105, 185 UK pounds. Exchange brought it down or brought it up to $317 Canadian. So then I looked at the BioLite stove and the pot, of course, to go with it. And the stove alone was $200 Canadian and $70 for the pot. So $270. So, and yeah, about $45 cheaper to buy the BioLite. But is it worth all that extra weight and the few extra conveniences that it offers? I don't know. That's a decision you'll have to make. For me, it would not be. I would sooner go with this any day because not only is it heavier, but it's bigger, considerably bigger as well. If anybody owns one or has used one, yeah, you would know. Okay, so now I'm just going to switch back to a gas canister stove and what I came up with there. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to go line by line on this because uh, I will put all that in the video description. You can see I have pages of information here. So I'm just going to keep this very short. All right, so I did mention that it is important that you have a battery bank. So if you want to include that into the weight, the weight of my Claris uh, K5, 10,000 milliamp hour battery that I use to power this thing with, that adds a bit of weight. So now the whole kit, the whole kit comes in at 16 ounces for, or 480 grams, still half the weight of the BioLite. So that's something to consider. It's still half the weight and I'm going, to, I'm going to be taking that battery with me regardless. So I did the same kind of a comparison with some ultralight gas canister stove and, and pot and fuel. So what I used was a Hornet 2 titanium gas canister stove from Fire Maple 
and I used a 750 milliliter titanium pot, which was, it's not the lo-fi one that I used, it was a different one that I measured again, one, because I have a number of them. And I got a, and an eight ounce fuel can, because you have to have fuel for those, of course. You can't pick it up off the ground like you can out here. The weight for that came in at 19.4 ounces or 550 grams. So what, three ounces heavier than the, uh, uh, the lo-fi and everything else included in that. So again, weight wise, it's still heavier than the lo-fi. And you have a limited amount of gas. You only have eight ounces of it. Now, yes, you can get a good number of boils, and on any given day, you're, good, you're, you're never going to run out of fuel from an eight-ounce canister. It's going to last you a fair amount of time. I think I actually did the boils. Eight-ounce canister will give you as many as 37 boils. But there's a cost to that, right? Eight-ounce canisters of, of uh, isobutane are not free. They do cost something. I picked the sticks up walking 10 feet away from around me and picked them up off the ground. They have to be dry. Now, they don't, that's not entirely true. They don't have to be bone dry. I mean, the sticks here right now are bone dry. They probably would have exploded if I put a match to them. They're so dry. But that's not necessary. What I found is if you load your fuel up, and even if it's not marginal, and I don't mean soaking wet or green, but if it's not totally dry, if you can get a little bit of a fire going on top of it for a top-lit fire, T-LED, T, top-lit updraft fire, which is the way you use most uh, wood gas stoves, it's going to work. The fuel is going to burn regardless. And this was especially true over the winter where my fuel was not only damp but frozen. And I'd break the sticks up, I'd put them in, and I'd get a little fire going on top of it with the driest material I could go get. And I would see steam coming off them as much as I would see anything else coming off them. But they burned. And that's something I can't say of too many stoves. And it's all because of the oxygen being pumped into this stove through the fan at the bottom. It just works so well that way. All right, as I mentioned, I'm going to leave all the information that I have, this pages of stuff, in the video description if you want to get a little geeky and look at some of the comparisons I made. You have to keep in mind that the prices that I'm quoting are prices that I would buy things for here in Canada, not what they are in the UK, Europe, or in the United States. So keep that in mind. You'll have to do your own prices that way. Now, there is one downside to this stove, and this became very apparent to me early on in the testing. It's not a deal breaker, you just need to be aware, because I haven't mentioned it, and I'm sure somebody's thinking about it. What about using it with an alcohol stove? So um, I tried it. I tried it with a Trangia. Trangia drops in well. I tried it with my uh, Goshawk Swirling Flame, which is very close to the same size. I tried it with uh, a Luxada uh, Capillary Hoop Stove. They worked. And actually, it's quite impressive. When you turn the fan on, it's, it's a real tornado of flame. But it didn't make them faster. In fact, it made them slower. I got better times operating the alcohol stoves outside of the lo-fi stove than I did inside the lo-fi stove. This doesn't mean it's not worth taking an alcohol stove with you. Just you'll have to have a separate stand if you want to get your maximum fuel efficiency. And I, you know, I'll, I'll say that was a little bit of a letdown, but I got over that very quickly because I can use wood pellets, and it's probably easier in the long run to use wood pellets than it was the alcohol. I just needed a little bit of alcohol gel to get them going. Okay, so that's everything I have. I guess let's answer the question: Is it worth the money? Because I said in the beginning, it's not cheap. This is one of those things that it's up to you. You have to decide if the ultralight weight, the free fuel, and the extremely good performance is worth that money. That's what it's all about. Because I can say it does all of that. It is ultralight, it is highly effect, fuel efficient, and it's, it's, it just works so well in all weather. Because I've used it, like I said, right through the winter. If that's important to you and you want that, then it's worth the money to you. That's what, it, what I'd have to say about it. Okay, this is likely to generate a bit of a discussion, and I welcome that. Like I said, I've got the experience. I should be able to talk about this quite readily. I'll put all the information I have in the video description, as well as the links and the, the specifications for it and everything else. I will link uh, Johnny's channel on the end of this video if you want to go over and see what he's doing over there. And uh, yeah, if you have any comments or questions, put them in the comments section below. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.